you as we begin our lesson here, if we're all ready to learn. But first, class, like we've done the last few times, we're going to have ourselves a little breathing exercise. Just a couple of deep breaths to get us started off on the right track. For those of you who have been here before, you know how it works. If you haven't, we'll tell you a little bit about it. What we do is we just sit back, sit up straight, nice and comfortable, our shoulders back, our feet flat on the ground. And you're going to place one hand or claw or paw or hoof or whatever it is that you have. And you're going to put it on your abdomen, just below the breastbone. And you're going to take the other hand and you're going to put it on your chest. And we're going to take three deep, slow breaths in through the nose. And I want you to pull that air in down into the bottom of your lungs, into the diaphragm, that muscle that's below the lungs. Like we've talked about, the bottom of the lungs has most of the surface area, most of the space where your oxygen can be pulled in. And you need to give your lungs time to pull that oxygen out. So we're going to take three deep, slow breaths, taking four seconds in, holding gently at the top for two seconds, and then exhaling through your open mouth for six seconds, letting all the air out. And with your hand on your abdomen, you'll feel it extend. You want to do deep belly breathing and not the shallow, rapid breathing that we do from the top of the chest. So I'm just going to let you know when to start. I won't count it off this time. We know how to do it. So when I say go, take those three deep, slow breaths in, hold them, and let them out. I'm ready. All right, class. Ready? Three, two, one, inhale. And hold. And out. When it's all up, go ahead and inhale again. And hold at the top. Let it out. And inhale one more time. And hold at the top. And let it all out. There we go. Three nice, good, deep breaths to start us off right. Hello, Mushroom. Welcome, welcome. It is good to see you. Thank you for joining us here on our first ever collaboration with our little friend, Caramel Bandit, here. That was so peaceful, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> Perfect. You want to start off on a nice foot or claw or paw or foot or hoof or whatever it is you have. We just say appendage. Appendage. Whatever limb ending that you have. <laughs> start off moving in the right direction. Just a brief review here of what we talked about last time. We talked about how overstimulation in the modern world is really harming us. It's really causing us problems and we should try to do fewer things at once. Just a bit of a review page here for you to look at if you need a refresher on what we went over last time. How we should be doing one task at a time whenever we can that we will finish our tasks faster and remember them better if we do them one at a time. And that the reason that there are so many jokes around about how people can't eat without watching a video in the background is because we keep overstimulating ourselves with all different kinds of media sources all happening at once. Bright lights, loud sounds, constantly in our brains, everything buying for our attention. And now we're going to talk about something that overlaps a lot with that, social media. Things like Twitter. You know, that things that birds do. Tweet, tweet. Uh, hard on eggs, you say that's you, you got to have your YouTube video on when you eat. No, it does not help make the food go down, eggs. You're not, you're not enjoying the food as much as you would if you were just focusing on the food. I think, I think sometime during this month, we'll do a mindful eating exercise. 
Some of you may have heard that, that topic before. We talked about the things you can do to deal with overstimulation, like doing a digital detox, getting some daily physical activity, flying around outside, engaging in some hobbies like collecting trinkets and shiny baubles, mm. maintaining social connections, collecting a murder, mm. engaging in mindfulness activities and intentional activities, what I call single tasking. But that's just the review for what we talked about last time. Let's talk about the monkey in the room or elephant in the room or bird in the room, whatever. <laughs> or the Let's, monkey that's on the bird. The monkey on the bird. On the elephant in the room. <laughs> we have an old lady in the, what's the old lady in the fly? What's that nursery rhyme? Oh, yeah. It, the I old lady who swallowed a. Old lady who swallowed a fly. Yeah. Uh, yes. I think that was it. Just to swallow increasingly hilarious large animals. Yes. So we're going to talk about social media health. Well, Class, Bird, what are your experiences? Let's start where you are. Let's start with what we know. What have been your experiences in social media? Positive? Negative? Hmm. Well, let's see. For me, it's very mixed. Because <laughs> I've never really been one to use a lot of social media. A lot of the social media that I have now... Um, I had never really used before I started streaming, so Twitter and and Instagram and, and TikTok and everything, is all, it's all fairly new to me. The only thing I really used before would have been YouTube and Discord. But the negative experiences I've had was when I first started doom scrolling. That was kind of a terrifying experience realizing that it was happening. Yeah, you can kind of happen to see it in real time happening and realize, oh, this is what people were talking about. As Egg <laughs> says, nothing like the 72-hour Twitter argument. Yeah. I think when <laughs> I I found myself once, uh, I saw a tweet that was like, just something really pissed me off. You know, something really dumb that someone says, sometimes usually just for intentional effect to, to make someone mad. And I realized, wait a minute, I've been scrolling into this person's argument with people and it looks like these posts are from, like, two weeks ago. Nobody else in this even remembers what's happening. I'm the only person on Earth who's looking at this right now. No one else will ever remember it. What am I doing with my life? Exactly. Hard on eggs. When they go low, you go low-er? No. No. Dig up. Dig up, <laughs> says the meme. Well, let's talk a little bit about how social media works, how it does these things to us. It works a lot like gambling, to be honest with you, physiologically speaking. It works on our reward system. It changes it. It provides what's called variable feedback. You're getting feedback from it, and you're excited because you don't know what it's going to be next time. It could be a reply, it could be a like, it could be a retweet. It feeds into our natural reward system, our task reward. We do something and we get something out of it. It ties into social validation too because all of that feedback is coming externally. It's coming from other people, usually real people. Often it's bots, but you know what I mean. And we're inherently social creatures, humans and badgers and birds. It's true. We crave a sense of belonging and being a part of something. And social media, media makes us feel like we are. It exploits our desire for social feedback to be a part of a larger whole. But of course, there's also FOMO. And we know what FOMO is, right? That's right, fear of missing out. We see everyone else's life broadcast and advertised on social media then you think, well, what about mine? Isn't my life as important? Shouldn't everyone be hearing my thoughts every day, all the time? Don't they want to see every deranged thought that passes through my head? What passes for thoughts in my head? <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of people who should be speaking less on the internet. Exactly. The world does not need to hear my every thought. 
but it does make us feel left out. It exploits our desire to see and to be seen. No. Eggs, you say the only FOMO you've had with is with online shopping. Well, that's a whole separate other problem that also ties into consumerism. But if I get on that rant, I might get demonetized. <laughs> I think the most controversial thing I've said on my channel so far is that we should ban billboards nationwide. I'd be fine with that. They get in the way of the birds flying. It's true. I have hit my head on many a billboard. Don't stop there, eggs, you say? Hello, Blue Solaris. Hello. Welcome. Welcome in. Hi, Blue. Take a seat. Mm -hmm. Be a good noodle. Yes, yes. Be good noodles. Eggs, you say ban all advertising? I mean, I'm okay with that, too. But how will I know when the next graphics card comes out? How will I know when the next game comes out that I need to buy and then never play because it stays on my backlog forever? Clearly society would collapse without knowing what the current game is. Yes, exactly. Bit Shepard, it seems, you're right, it does seem whatever your weakness is, there is a platform to put its hooks in you. And that's another point that isn't in the... Oh yes, Blue, that is a, a lemur. That is a lemur on Crozy's head. That's, it's a capuchin monkey. It's a capuchin monkey. Yes, yes, because if you weren't aware, December 14th is National Monkey Day. So please, let us know everyone's favorite monkey. But yes, that's a very good point, uh, Bit Shepherd. All of the different platforms do find a new and unique way to exploit all of these things. Uh, if you are someone whose weakness may be a little bit of narcissism, well, then there's Instagram. If you're someone whose weakness is maybe being loud and needing your opinions heard, well, then there's Twitter for you. Each one has something unique to put its hooks into you. And that ties into the next point we have here on the algorithm. We're kept hooked up to content that either excites or repulses us. Because it doesn't matter if it's negative. It doesn't matter if we don't like what we're seeing it's still engaging one way or the other if you see something terrible you might still want to comment on it and usually we do we end up with a curated experience but it's not curated by us it's curated by whatever is going to keep us scrolling whatever is going to keep us engaged arguing with that idiot who turns out to be a bot from a bot farm in Timbuktu stand or wherever <laughs> it does remind me that it, one of the oldest rules of the internet is don't feed the trolls and I feel like a lot of people have forgotten that yes indeed that lesson has been lost on many the new internet does not understand I don't know if you saw that video that happened uh, today or came out today where one of those bad faith uh, debate me bro type persons set up a video camera and was asking someone a really bad uh, like bad faith question a false dichotomy and then some guy who looks exactly like, like when I show you this picture, you're going to be like, oh, that's, that guy looks like he was a Reddit mod, or that guy looks like he, uh, he was on the Something Awful forums, or, you know, he was on the internet before 4chan existed. He looks like a, a dungeon master. He looks like uh, a caricature of someone, of an internet nerd from the 90s. Well, this, uh, I think I actually know what you're talking about. yeah, this debate bro tries to engage this guy in this thing. And the guy completely just destroys him because he's he's done this before. He's been in these bad faith internet arguments since before fo Facebook existed. You know, when YouTube was just a glint in that person's eye that invented it. That's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about here. You, you don't have to feed the trolls. And he didn't. He just told the person straight up to their face. I'm not, I won't accept your false premise. I'm not going to engage with your terrible argument. I'm just going to say no, and if you don't like it, sit on it. Oh yes, Massive eggs. respect for that guy. You just know that that guy's got the sickest Warhammer army. <laughs> All hand-painted. But yes, what well, the last point I wanted to make on how it works is that it has a persistent presence. Even if you're not looking at it, even if it's out of sight, out of mind, and you think that you're not using it, it's still there always waiting and lurking. And at any moment, it can send you a notification. It can send you an alert. And you are conditioned. You've got this Pavlovian thing happening when you hear that ding or you see that red one on the app. Well, now you're back in. 
You're checking it again. Now you're scrolling once more. It exploits our natural curiosity. Birds are curious beings. Very. I get lost on, on little rabbit holes on the internet every so often. Yes, yes. And that, I think, ties in really well with what we've been talking about in the past of stimulation. We get into these rabbit holes. It's We see something we haven't seen before, and now we're stimulated. We gotta chase it down all the way to the end. Because we're so burnt out on all the other stimulation we've had that, they, hey, this is at least something new, at least something interesting. I've heard all of these other arguments before, but this person says that birds aren't real? I need to I need to investigate this. Not real? No. Did you not know that? You were a government well, conspiracy. Well, I mean, I do now. Government conspiracy. Absolutely not. I refuse. I will simply say no. That's a very good point, Sad Panda. Just try to swipe it off. In fact, it's one of the tips, tips that we'll give is to minimize notifications at all, if you can, just to what's essential. So what does all this social media do to us? Well, well, it burns out our dopaminergic system. That's a long word, but the long and short of it is it takes more and more to give us that little shot, to give us that little boost of, hey, I have a notification. Hey, someone responded to me. Just like the overstimulation, where we need constantly more and more sources. We need to watch a video while we're eating, while we have our message uh, service up, Discord or whatever. It changes our literal physical structure of the brain. Like we talked about in the overstimulation lesson, certain areas of the brain actually get thinner or thicker depending on what you're doing with your internet time. It can make it physically harder for you to change your behaviors and to change your habits because that self-control, that emotional regulation system in your brain is now changed. Pathways have been altered. And for myself, I have a little bird brain, just like my friend here. And it's hard enough. <laughs> it's hard enough to get to sleep. It's hard enough to maintain the correct stress hormone balance. Because you do need stress hormone. We undergo stress because it helps us to grow and change. Like when you work out, there are stress hormones released so that you can be built back up. But when all you have is stress, you never have any time to recuperate. It can be good to do things that are challenging. It can even be good to get into arguments, to sharpen yourself. But if all you have is arguments and burnout, you never recover, you never recuperate, and you don't learn as well. And it leads to the things that we see on the screen here. We get increasing anxiety. We're anticipating that next little shot, and we need it more and more. It leads to isolation and feeling like we are a part of things, but still a part. There's stuff going on in the world and it doesn't involve us. And of course, there's that aspect of social comparison, that there are people out there that are just better than us, or maybe they're worse people, but they have better lives than us that they don't deserve. And I can say this as a, a streamer now, I'm constantly, whether I want to or not, I see people and I compare myself to them. You know, they, they're so much more successful than me at this. They've been, haven't been doing it as long, but they're already better or their content is just better. They're smarter at this or, you know, Hey, maybe their content sucks and I think they're, they're ass, but you know, they've got a huge following. <laughs> it's hard to avoid making those comparisons sometimes. And even outside of the streaming world, looking at people who have like further along in their careers and so on and so on. It's a long laundry list. Exactly. Exactly, Blue. Oh boy, envy. The desire for what <laughs> someone else has. And then of course, jealousy related. People use them interchangeably, but they're a little bit different. Jealousy is more the fear that you will lose what you have to someone else. So you might see someone who has something you don't 
but also is better at the things that you do and you think well i wish i had what they had and i i hope i don't lose what i have to them yikes but we talked about overstimulation as well in terms of attention and memory and cognition social media is maybe the best encapsulation of hyperstimulation you're hooked to it 24 7. it's tethered to you it's always in your phone it can always pull you back in and so that's why the tips that we're going to talk about are so important so what can we do what can we do about our social media addiction well the first thing of course is to set boundaries you want to set times that you will simply not be using social media make it a priority Put it in your calendar if you have to. These are times where I will not be using social media. I'm in school at this time. I'm not going to be scrolling my phone, distracting myself, not paying attention to my lesson. I won't use social media in class. It can be as simple as that. You can start there. You can say, I won't use social media while I'm eating. I'm just going to enjoy my food and not watch a video while I'm eating. Anybody have any examples of times when they think maybe that would be a good idea to set aside to not use social media? You know, maybe on a date or something? I don't know. Oh, can I raise my hand? Yes, please. So, something that I've done fairly recently, whenever I catch myself doom scrolling, I have a time set in my head that if I realize that I'm doom scrolling, I'm not allowed to go past the 15 minute marks. So if I hit the one hour mark, 15 minute mark, half hour, 45, and so on on the clock. For every 15 minute interval, once I hit those, I have to stop automatically. Shut it down. Doesn't matter if I've only been doom scrolling for like three minutes or the full 15. Those are my, those are my hard lines. I think that's a great it's idea. Helped, it's helped a lot. I know another friend of mine, he sets it at the half hour mark because he's still, he's still working to get it to the... <laughs> the smaller amounts of time, but any any like boundaries you can set for yourself work great. I have an entire day of the week, so for me, I, I choose Sundays that I pretty much just separate myself fully from pretty much every form of social media and online ventures, and I just kind of enjoy the day at home or at the park or whatever. Those are fantastic ideas, and uh, I think Bit's point here is, is another one. Twitter cued you into COVID early. But then it showed you what other people were worried about in the world. And that buries you in the doom and anxiety and the stress 24-7, yes. Mm. And I think... I know I, that happens to my mom a lot. I think your point there, uh, Crozy, is very good. I think that ties into one of the other bullet points we have here of digital detox. Having a prepared, planned, set-aside time. Because then you get the opportunity to think... Well, geez, I've got all this time that I'm not spending doom scrolling. Well, what else can I do? I can do something more useful, more fun. And I think it's good to do that detox both as a one-time thing, to sort of get yourself a little bit of cold turkey to be like, okay, this week on Friday, I'm not going to use social media at all. And then from now on, I won't use social media, say, while I'm eating. And then I'll take uh, eight hours on Saturdays and not use social media. Whatever comfortable limits you can find to start with, because it is just a start. You don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to eat the elephant all at once. <laughs> you can start with just a little bite. Just start with the fly. Start with the fly, and then eventually you're swallowing the elephant. So then our third bullet point that we're talking about, of course, is curation. Looking at each individual feed, each individual app, each individual thing that you follow or notification you get and asking yourself, is this useful? Is this something that is providing me with enjoyment or important information? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? And if not, then unfollow. Tell it you're not interested. If it's something promoted, tell it you don't want to see it. There are still tools you have to curate your experience, even though the social media platforms are doing everything they can to show you what they want you to see. You do still have the power. Use it while you can. Have you ever had someone 
or something or some post come up and you think, God, why am I even seeing this? I didn't, I didn't mean to follow this. I didn't want to see this. This isn't what I signed up for. Oh yeah, all the time. I'll, I follow a lot of random artists that I just like their art style on Twitter. And uh, sometimes they'll post things that I'm like, oh, that's really not what I was looking for. <laughs> Whatever it might be. And I'm like, well, it's a shame. I'm gonna just save the pictures that I liked. Make sure I have them credited in the thing where I've saved them in my folder. And then just unfollow them. Me indeed. A lot of times now when I, I follow someone, it turns out that they're a bot anyway. And as soon as I add them, they like, I get the, the DM. Thank you for the follow back. How are you doing? Did you know that I'm a digital artist and I can help you with your assets? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Every single time. Man. Every, Every single time. time. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the other things that ties into that is doing this is a good time. It's a good excuse to review all of your privacy. This is a good opportunity since you're looking at things anyway. To look at those security options, tell it you don't want it yourself to be tracked, you don't want it to track your cookies, you don't want to help them optimize their system by using your data for AI purposes, which they're starting to do now, putting in their TOS so you can, if you can, uncheck that kind of stuff. It's not just about protecting your identity either with security, it's about your privacy and them tracking you across different sites across different apps and using your data to make money. I think the last point I wanted to make on this screen at least is limiting your notifications. As you mentioned, uh, Blue, I believe. Turn off anything that's not essential. I had a, a Snapchat group with some classmates and at first I thought, well, this will we'll just be talking about classroom stuff. This one I'll keep on because somebody might say something about an assignment or I might have a question about an assignment. So I, I got started getting notifications all the time from it. And then I realized, oh, they're all just posting their pics from the bar. <laughs> they're all just talking about the bar crawl and, uh, you know, talking about how the class sucked that day. And well, maybe it did, but, you know, hey, that's not useful notifications for me to get. So I think I'll just turn notifications off and I'll check it on occasion to see if anyone said anything useful. Oh, Cyrus, you just got a DM from a, quote, digital artist. Yeah, that just said Cyrus. Yeah, they're, they're getting less and less creative and just more and more bald-faced. You know, I hope that whoever I'm messaging is an idiot and that they will click on whatever links I sent. And there's far too many that do click anyways. Uh, Bit Shepard, you ask, uh, is group text the worst form of communication ever invented? In terms of texting, <laughs> texting, yes. Because then it's just like, I just see a string of phone numbers and I don't even know who's saying what in the te group text. It's awful. Yeah, I've that's... had it happen before. Cause then you just, you don't know who's who and you, most of the time, I don't know what's being talked about. No. And you know, I like most people nowadays and my generation and now Gen Z after me, we don't use the phone to talk. I don't even use the phone to text. I use the phone as an internet machine. If I need to co contact customer service, I'm gonna send an email. And if they don't have an email service, I'm canceling my service. If I, if I have to call someone, if I have to press one or yell associate constantly to get someone on the phone, I'm not going to use that company. Where was where were we? Where was I? Hey, oh yes, next next slide. Yeah, but before we got we got a little distracted. Got a little distracted there. <clears throat> what else can we do? Important topics, all the same. The next thing was critically thinking about that social comparison part. Remember that what you see is not what you get. Ooh. What you're seeing is that person's best all the time. They're showing you only what they want you to see. Most people don't tell you about when they're struggling. They don't tell you about the bad days. What you see on Instagram is that person's best foot forward whenever they can. They want you to see them at their prettiest and their most successful and their happiest. But that's not what most people are like most of the time. It's certainly not what I'm like most of the time. Focus on your own growth. 
rather than what other people are doing. Because what you see is not what you get. Oh, if I could say something too with that, <clears throat> I have noticed a little bit of a trend of people showing off their absolute lowest at the same time too. And I've seen people kind of flock to that in almost an intoxicating way where it's, they, they might even straight up be lying about, oh, this is the absolute worst thing that's ever happened. Come flock to me. Yeah. And harvesting sympathy too. Yeah, it, it, it does end up still being what you see is not what you get, good or yeah, bad. Exactly. Life is not all bad, but of course it's not all peaches and cream for everyone all the time. Uh, eggs, you say, oh, it's close enough to 5 a.m. It is time to sleep. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for joining us. You need to start getting better sleep. We'll talk about this later. <laughs> I might have to move your your clip down for not following our sleep health guidelines. And it was nice to meet you too, Eggs. Get sleep. Sleep like a bird. I'm a good noodle! I'm a good noodle! Nighty night eggs. <laughs> Should they sleep well enough? At least with their eggs. Yes. You know eggs. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> not all peaches and cream, Noma. No, that was not a reference to furries. I know the reference you're making, but again, we are a safe for all ages classroom here. Oh no. That one went right over my head. Now I'm worried. No need for the, the little bird to fear. I will protect you from the machinations of Nomakin. <laughs> our next our next bullet point here is to focus on diverse activities. We talked about hobbies in the last lesson, and it applies here too. You want to reduce your reliance on social media as something to fill up your time. And it reduces your desire for social media. And even if it doesn't necessarily limit the amount of social media you use, you're using social media then on something that is at least purposeful and intentional. You're using social media to stay involved and engaged in those activities. So it leads me to the last two bullet points. The first of which is to focus on the positives. And this is the point where, if we were in person, and we'll do it here too. If we were in person, I would have you physically write down on a piece of paper the things you think social media is good for. Things that it does have benefits. Benefits about. But you can just put it in the chat. List a thing or two that you think social media is beneficial for. Things that, it, that you think it can augment or help with. Ways that you think it's good for society. Let's take a moment and think about some of the things that it's actually good for. I know one thing that I'm really happy for is uh, the ready access to information for even e from everything from satisfying curiosity to trying to better understand topics that I on my own know very little about. Oh, that's a really good one. It connects you to people who have knowledge and facts, things that you don't know. Uh, Bit Shepherd says discovering other people who think things that are uncommon. Noma Ken reaching out to people you'd otherwise never meet. Uh, Blue using it to get art references and tips. These are all some very good things, very beneficial things that social media does offer us. Now, if you think if you were only to use social media for those things, it doesn't seem like social media would really offer you that much of a problem. Yeah, and Bitch Shepherd makes the point Facebook is usually the worst thing but it's invaluable for people with, uh, say, a rare disease to find support. I think that ties into some of the other points there. It connects people with others who have, say, a like-minded interest or issue. And if we use social media for those things in those ways, then what would the problem be? It's, it's all of the other attendant issues that are involved in social media. Focus on these kinds of things. If you use social media to stay engaged and in touch with issues you care about, people you think have useful information for you, 
staying in touch with friends, finding art references. Focus on those things, and if you find yourself using it for something else, and you say, wow, I'm really not enjoying my experience on social media, well, it's probably because you're using it for something that isn't actually beneficial for you. Uh, Blue says, yeah, you only use it to do for that stuff and to follow game devs. You didn't know people used it for anything else? Blue, there's a, there's a whole <laughs> world out there that's using social media in the absolute worst way possible, and you, you could not imagine the things that we're getting up to out there. Good on you, Blue, that you've, you've been using it for those. Oh, bit Shepard, you miss artists and authors on Twitter so much. Yes, I, it is, and I'm going to use this word. It's not a swear word. I rarely, I rarely swear unless I'm playing Elden Ring. The term is <laughs> enshittification. And this is the actual term for the progressive uh, worsening of any app or program as the owners, the shareholders or whoever, have less and less reason to make it good because they've already got all the users. They don't need to do anything to make it better because everyone's already here and they're stuck there. There isn't a better alternative yet. Hmm. Artists and authors have fled Twitter quite a lot, yes. And then it's hard to know, well, where did they go? Where's the next big thing, the next Twitter? Is it Blue Sky? Well, it's not yet. Uh, Blue Slayer says, your Brian gets overwhelmed, honestly, and then corrected yourself to brain. Yes, indeed. You never understand how people get into doom scrolling for hours. There is an element of addiction to it that we've talked about in our previous lesson on overstimulation. We get a bit addicted to the to the catharsis of it, to the to the stress release of it. It's uh it's a, a very God, and there, there was discourse about the Cenobites lately, if you know what the Cenobites are, the Hellraiser demons. Where people just sort of enjoy the pain. It's one of the few things that can still give you a dopamine hit in a negative way. It's sort of that, you know, any attention is good attention sort of thing. It, it is, and Bit Shepherd, I, I appreciate you bringing up that, that idea. And this is not a term that I would use lightly, trust me, as a health teacher. But there is an element of self-harm about it in that we, we are engaging in intentionally harmful behaviors because it makes us feel something. And that's, I don't think that's overstating it either. And that's why some of these, uh, some of these solutions are so important to deal with hyperstimulation, to deal with our stress addiction, to deal with our social media unhealth. Because, hmm, this is about your long-term quality of life. There is some research out there now that says that because of how much we're burning out our dopamine systems. That dopaminergic system is what is the, it's what's at play in Parkinson's disease and some other conditions. There is evidence that our social media addiction, that internet addiction actually increases our long-term risk for things like dementia and Parkinson's. And that can seem a little scary, but it's important to think about in that it, if it doesn't feel good in the moment and it's going to cause you long-term harm in the future, do you really want to put off making some positive changes? I don't think you should. I think you should try and do some of these things as soon as you can. Try them this week. Maybe you think, well, I'll do it next Monday. That's okay. If you want to have a nice fresh start on Monday, you can do that. Slowly build some of these things into your daily routine. When you get up in the morning, try that breathing exercise. When you're going to sleep, take a few deep breaths. Do that stretching routine we did. Put down your phone and don't scroll at all for a half hour before bed. Get a good night's sleep and start limiting your social media presence. Start limiting your exposure to these toxic influences. And the last thing I will say, I know that I've droned on quite a lot, is this last point here. Remember that it all goes back in the box. I talked about this when I mentioned the John Ortberg speech. When you're playing a game, after the game is over, all of the pieces go back in the box. What matters and what's left is not whether you won or lost the game or 
where the pieces fell on the board at the end. What matters is the memories that you made and the connections you had. Were they positive? Are you happy to remember them? Your memories of the times you spend on social media are probably not only negative, but you either won't remember them or you wish you won't remember them because it was a, it was a waste of time. You could have been doing something else. So when you start doing these things, and I hope that you do, remember to reach back and pull up. Reach back to others, to your friends, and tell them, hey, you know, why are you spending so much time on social media? Let's play a game instead. Let's talk instead. Help other people to do these things. So that's what you can do as an individual to help yourself deal with the glut of social media toxicity. You have any other tips or thoughts there, Crowbird? Monkey Bird? <laughs> um, I do really like that last point you made, though, about reaching out to others if you feel like they're, you know, a little too deep in the um, social media hole. Because I'll do that with friends every so often, and even with my brother, too. I'll, I'll see him, he'll just be scrolling, doom scrolling, essentially, through YouTube shorts for a while. I'll be like, hey, uh, let's go do something. Take dogs for a walk. Let's uh, let's go downstairs. Let's eat something together. Let's watch a TV show together. Just anything, anything, so that he's not just, you know, trapped in his own in his own little spiral. And the same thing, I try to reach out with my friends too. Like, hey, let's let's do something fun. Let's chat in VC for. A bit. Let's uh, play a game. Let's uh, watch a TV show. I know a good friend of mine. What he does on the regular is he will just stream TV shows in Discord throughout a lot of the day and we all just join in whenever we have time it gives us an opportunity to socialize to be together and not just sitting by ourselves doing whatever online that's a really great idea that's sort of a something i've talked about in nutrition classes is giving people options sometimes people will just eat whatever they is in front of them because that's uh, cheap and easy and convenient if you give them options there's a better chance that they'll choose something healthy to eat if you give people options for activities, if they know that, hey, at any time I can just pop into this room with my friends and watch something, they have something else to choose besides, well, I guess I'll go on YouTube. I guess I will scroll Twitter or Reddit. Yeah, give people choices. And that social connections aspect is key for both overstimulation and social media. Genuine connections, even when digital, because I don't make as much distinction between digital and in-person friendships. They're just as valid as long as they're genuine. When you're talking to that person, are you really talking to them? Or is it just a message that you're reading and responding to while you're doing something else? Are you giving them your full attention? If you are, if it's a genuine connection, then it's just as good. But yes, uh, bitch, everybody say that's how your friend group survived COVID. And that was that was a that was a, a trial by fire for a lot of people. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know my with my sister, that was a really hard thing with her friend group because she organized them to like meet up in person all the time. It was like every other week. And when COVID hit and they couldn't meet up, it, it really puts a little bit of a strain on all their friendships. But they managed <laughs> to make it through stronger and closer than ever before. Very good stuff. And I think we can then move on to what can we do together, collectively? We've talked about what social media, how social media works. We've talked about what it does to us. And we've talked about what we can do as individuals. So I'll just briefly touch on some points of what can we do collectively as a society. Just things to think about whenever you're, say, voting or you are talking with others about the issue. The number one and two things are digital literacy in schools. That's having education on skills just like this, things that I would like to teach in health classes myself if the curriculum will, would allow it. And media literacy in schools, having informed and knowledgeable media consumers. And this is something that a lot of schools would like to teach, but maybe just don't have teachers that have the expertise in it, or maybe they just don't have the room in the curriculum or they have other standards that they have to meet. But I think that this should be made a priority, especially in the modern age where 
We are so connected all the time, and we kind of have to be. Aurora, you say you... Oh, wait, let me test something right now. Okay, go ahead. Yes, indeed, Bit Shepherd. That they would get pushback from some parents. And that goes to our third bullet point here we have of parenting resources. Oh, yep, you got me, Aurora. Your spitballs are still very effective. <laughs> Even though I'm on the other side of the screen, your aim is still spot on. Monkey per in a box. <laughs> Monkey in a box. Monkey in a box. <laughs> parenting resources. Providing education to parents. Letting them know, hey, this is an important thing. We want to teach about this. Here's why. Parents are less likely to be unnerved about a new topic being taught when they're taught about it first. Some of them simply don't like being, simply don't like their kids learning something before they've learned it. Because then they don't know what it is you know, that you're teaching your kid. Their, your kid comes home and says, well, today we learned about digital literacy and we learned about exploitive social media. And they're like, well, well what the hell are you talking about? But yes, providing some education to parents. And of course, regulation. These big tech companies and social media companies need to be made to protect our privacy and to protect people from harassment on social media. Oh, Aurora, that's, that's a good point. You say the Prime Minister of the UK is working to ban under 16s from social media. And then we get all the way to the other end of people who think that they should completely control everyone else's behavior. Uh, if this is a little bit tied into what Twitch has been doing lately with their new content guidelines. We were talking about that a little earlier, Caramel Bandit. Yeah, it's... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I think they've they've kind of swung in a wrong direction. I think people are, have been saying, well, Twitch isn't really for kids anyway. Well, young people, young people deserve to have spaces online too. And it should be the default for any sort of large platform should be it is accessible and safe for everyone to join and use. And if you want to see other kinds of content, or if you want to have more of that free-for-all space, that should be something people have to opt into, rather than saying kids have to be cordoned off into another space. And I really try to avoid the term kids or, you know, children. For the most part, these are young people. They're, they're people. They're simply not as developed yet. They may not know, but that doesn't mean that they should be treated as less than a person. Um, so spaces should be available for all, and then other types of content is something you opt into rather than being, uh, you know, you have to be a certain age just to get onto Twitter or, you know, social media as the UK is trying to do right now. because these are important ways for young people to make connections in a way that they can feel is safe and secure. Especially, as we've been talking about with COVID, when in-person was virtually impossible for most people. And, you know, social media was a lifeline for a lot of individuals. I feel like I got off on another tangent there. <laughs> but yes, we need... I do feel like, though, that that is, that is another, like good thing about social media too was uh, during COVID it, it really was a lifeline for a lot of people it was really what kept them going through it absolutely I mean we wouldn't have been able to have as many you know interactions I certainly wouldn't have had as many interactions with my friends when you know not being able to meet in person and I, I live in a bitter a rural area now so there's not that many people out here yeah, exactly, Blue. Some people don't have the opportunity for good support groups offline. Sometimes you live, uh, and it's one of the points I'll bring up, it depends on the community. Whether it's rural or urban, sometimes the places just don't have the money for community. They don't have third spaces where people can gather. You know, libraries are being defunded. Uh, there aren't as many parks. There just isn't that, even outside of COVID. Uh, thanks, Aurora. There there just aren't that many spaces for young people to be young people. You know, there's school and there's home and where else? You know, old people will be like, well, back in my day, we were climbing trees. Well, what trees do you want them to climb? You cut them all down. We, oh, they should be outside playing. Where do you want them to play? In the Walmart parking lot that you paved over the park to put up? 
So, yeah, in, in many ways, online spaces are are critical right now, and they sh we should be finding ways to curate communities for young people so that they can get some, some meaningful, uh, somewhat natural social involvement. And I think the biggest last point is, of course, increasing access and availability of mental health service. I think that's the last point that I want to leave people with on this is to advocate for whenever you have the possibility of increasing the presence and prevalence and acceptability of using mental health services for yourself or anyone else who needs them. So that's all of the bullet points and talking points and tangents that I had for our little lesson. And I went on quite a bit because it's such an important topic. But I will open it up to all of us for your thoughts, questions, experiences, feedback, critique, rude hand gestures. <laughs> In blue you say, not your libraries. Yes, indeed, libraries are under attack in modern society in the West, unfortunately. One of the greatest inventions of the modern world, under threat for defunding. What a joyous time, indeed. The library is a wonderful place. It's a nice, it's, it's one of the few spaces left where you are not expected to spend money to be there. Exactly. Free access to a computer, free access to the internet, to a little quiet space to just kind of uh, calm your mind down from being out in the world all day. Free, and librarians, free books, free li librarians have so much knowledge and skill. Thank you for the gold stars, Bit Shepherd. They are knowledgeable and can help you with a job search, with a resume building. They can help you find resources uh, for addiction or uh, experiencing homelessness they truly are wonderful people and we should be thankful and paying them better just like we should be paying teachers better 100 percent. just like we should be paying teachers better just like we should be paying teachers better one more time for the people in the back just like we should be paying teachers better uh blue where are you else are you going to get your audie murphy autobiography now yes <laughs> See, I don't want you to have to go to Barnes and Noble or, you know, eBay or Amazon. Barnes and Noble. Oh, Aurora, yours gives free tickets. Gives tickets for food banks. Exactly. They are Ooh. wonderful for helping people find resources in need. 